Because the feedback on my recent interactive verbal and quant videos has been so good, I decided to do another such video for critical reasoning. So the way this works is I'm going to do a few questions. I think there's three here. This is from Magoosh, link in the description. And these questions I haven't seen before, but I'm going to use them to demonstrate the techniques that I would use for critical reasoning. Quick recap of those techniques. I've done several other videos on critical reasoning that I'd urge you to check out. But I'm going to quickly recap the techniques I'm going to use before doing the questions. The first technique is to read slowly not rush through reading. We have to conquer the passage before we get to the answer choices. If you rush, you'll get to the end, won't understand, won't know what angle they're going for, and be much more likely to get it wrong. So read slowly. Number two, we're going to critically engage with the text. What that means is we're going to say things like, hmm, interesting, I didn't know that. Why is that true? That sounds wrong to me. I disagree with that. That encourages the brain to actually be interested in the text and therefore your brain will have a much higher retention level compared to if you are not interested in what you're reading. If the brain is not interested and engaged, you won't remember or retain anything. So I'm going to trick the brain into being interested in the text. Number three, I'm going to try and predict the answer before I look at the answer choices and try and see the flow of the paragraph, spot any logical flaws or logical gaps and predict the answer. Anyway, enough build up. Let's get to the question. I haven't seen these before. There's three. We're going to see the answer as soon as I see the answer after each question. So you can see my mistakes live. I won't edit out any incorrect answers. Without further ado, let's get to this question seven. The Malbec grape, originally grown in France, has become the main varietal in Argentina. I don't know varietal, but sounds interesting. This is surprising, surprising, because most Malbec grown in Argentina is grown at high altitudes. Hmm. Whereas the Malbec grape once was grown at low altitudes. Why is it grown at high altitudes when before it was grown at low altitudes? Therefore, Argentinian wine growers should grow the Malbec grape at low elevations. First things first, I don't really agree with that. Just because something worked in France at low elevations why should it not work at high elevations in Argentina? Just because something works in one place doesn't mean a different thing can't work in another place. So I don't agree with the conclusion here. We can imagine many reasons why Argentina is going to be different from France and therefore it doesn't matter about the elevation down in Argentina or whatever. Anyway, which of the following, if true, would most weaken the conclusion? Remember, the conclusion is very specific. The conclusion is about Argentinian wine growers growing the Malbec grape at low elevations. So I'm particularly looking out for answers that relate to that specific conclusion. I'm not going to get distracted by other things. Okay, the Bordeaux grape is the most popular grape in France. No, this is not going to be right. Okay, so yeah, we're not talking about Bordeaux grape. B, some varietals are unable to grow at high altitudes. The main reason I don't like that, the word some, okay, just because some are unable to grow at high altitudes doesn't mean others aren't. So I don't like that. And I don't really see how that particularly relates to Argentina anyway. C, the soil at high altitudes is filled with nutrients that help the Malbec grape grow. Well, that would directly weaken the conclusion. The conclusion is relating to wine growers growing at high altitudes and being told to grow at low. But they would look at C and go, well, look, it's got nutrients. Why should we go down to low elevations? It's working. So I'm liking C. It's not perfect because it doesn't talk about Argentina and Argentinian soil, but it's decent. C is decent. D, the Malbec vine is susceptible to phylloxera, a plant louse that grows at low altitudes. Ooh, that is tough because that does bring in Malbec specifically and does give a reason why low elevations or altitudes aren't necessarily best for it because it's got this disease. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily relate to Argentina because we don't know if that disease is present in Argentina. Hmm, this is going to be tough between C and D. E, Malbec has recently enjoyed a surge in popularity 
and can be found in many different countries. We're not talking about how popular it is, we're talking about where it should be grown. So it's definitely between C and D. What is my thought process here to decide between those two answers? The soil at high altitudes is filled with nutrients that help the Malbec grape grow. Mm, that's kind of a reason why they should stay, but it's not. D, the Malbec vine is susceptible to this disease, a plant mass that only grows at low altitudes. Some people would argue that because D specifically uses the phrase low altitudes, then that more directly links to the conclusion about low elevations in that final sentence. So you could argue that D is tighter toward the conclusion. So D is looking like my default choice, but I have to double check because what's wrong with C? The soil at high altitudes. Yeah, I really can't distinguish C and D that well. This is definitely my weakness in not being able to see the difference there. I think C looks like a decent answer too. D, as I say, seems slightly tighter to the conclusion, but I genuinely don't know. So let's just find out. You know my default guess. And I was right, D, yes. That is a very tough one. I was right, but I really didn't know why C was wrong. Want to know why C is incorrect? Click here to view the answer and explanation. This is going to be a different link. Okay. The Malbec grape, once grown in France. Okay. Where's the answer here? It's a video explanation. What about text explanation? Here we go. So this is what they say about this. Answer C. You know why I think D was better, because it more tightly related to the conclusion. But they say, this answer choice is very tempting. It gives a good reason as to why farmers might not want to move the Malbec to low altitudes, since the soil at high, let me zoom out so you can see that a bit more. However, the answer has two flaws. The first flaw is similar to the one found in B. It refers to most varietals. Did C talk about most varietals? Help many of the I didn't see that. Ah, C had the word many. So it doesn't necessarily help all of the varietals flourish. Did the original question have many? Ah, no, it didn't. They've changed it. No, because look, C here didn't have the word many. So I was right not to spot it. So I don't know. They're saying that the word C, the answer C had the word many in, but it didn't, it didn't, not in the original version. It doesn't refer to most varietals. In this question here, on the website, they have many, but not in the original that we saw. Going back, basically, I would say that C and D were indeed actually two viable correct answers. And again, why did I pick D here? I'm quite proud of this one. The reason that I picked D was because it specifically talked about low altitude, so it mirrored the words in the conclusion slightly more tightly than C did, and that's why I picked it. And it was right, but that was really tough. I genuinely was conflicted there. Anyway, hopefully this next question is going to be slightly more clear cut, but either way, you saw my thought process there for a very, very hard question. Downtown Greensboro is a major financial center in which many citizens either drive or rely on public transportation to get to work. Okay, so they drive or go on public transportation because it's a big center. This setup has led up to a spate in the number of pedestrians who have been struck and killed by vehicles. Oh no. In an effort to curb the number of pedestrian related fatalities, Greensboro has installed speed reduction signs at the six city intersections in which the highest number of fatalities have occurred in the last year. Okay, so they've got signs to say, reduce your speed. Is that gonna be effective? Mm, maybe, maybe not. The Greensboro city government predicts that the number of pedestrian fatalities will significantly decrease once the speed reduction signs have been installed. So that's the conclusion that the number of fatalities will go down when these signs go up. I've got a few problems with that. Number one, is there any real evidence that signs are gonna reduce speed? I don't know. Number two, what happens if the number of people driving continues to go up and up and up, even though the percentage of people speeding might go down, 
the overall number of cars that are speeding might go up. So that's another problem there. I guess a final problem that you could predict, maybe this isn't the best prediction, but is it necessarily the speeding that's killing the pedestrians? Maybe there's other factors involved, in which case that won't help. So all these different ideas floating about, hard to make a specific uh, prediction, but those are some of the ideas I'm thinking about. All the different reasons why or why not speed reduction signs will help. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to strengthen the validity of the conclusion. We are trying to say, yes, definitely speed reduction signs will reduce specifically fatalities. Okay. A. Some of those who drive to work in downtown Greensboro have a valid driver's license. Terrible. No, nothing to do with licenses. The number of annual pedestrian fatalities outside the downtown area is far less than the downtown area. Well, are we talking about downtown versus not downtown? And it doesn't really say whether these signs are in the downtown, but they're in the city intersection, so you presume that's maybe downtown. But this doesn't seem that good of an answer really to me. The six intersections, this is much better, we're talking about the intersections at least, in which the signs are installed, are responsible for a majority of the pedestrian deaths. Here we go. This is much better as an answer. Why is it better? We're specifically talking about those six intersections where the signs are going to go up. So we like that. And the answer talks about pedestrian deaths, which is specifically what the conclusion was predicting about. Furthermore, logically, if those intersections have the most number of deaths, that's where you'd want the signs. The only question of, about it I've got is, didn't we know that already? They've installed speed reduction signs in the six city intersections in which the highest number of fatalities have occurred in the last year. So didn't we know that? We're responsible for a majority. Okay, so this is tightening it, it's strengthening it, because it's kind of like before, we just knew it was the highest number of fatalities. Now we know it's a majority of all fatalities. So it further strengthens the idea that this is the place to have the signs. Okay, so I'm really liking C. It's not 100% perfect. So it might be dislodged as my favorite answer, but it's very, very good for all the reasons I just gave. The new speed reduction signs will be in neon orange and prominently placed. Just not really good enough. Like there's no indication that they won't be clear anyway. So I don't know why they need to add in the fact that they're gonna be neon orange. I mean, it's good in the sense of it's more visible, but maybe it would have been visible anyway. Is this really adding anything? Red light cameras, which are used to catch motorists running red lights, were installed, yet the number of pedestrian fatalities did not decrease. Well, that actually weakens the conclusion because it's saying people ignore cameras. Maybe they're gonna ignore the signs as well. But remember, we are trying to strengthen the conclusion. We are trying to say that this plan will work. So I am pretty sure that C will be correct. It's very tight wording, very closely linked to the conclusion. And the other answer is just kind of suck, to be honest. So that's my answer. And it is C. I was pretty confident about that one. In this case, what the test writers are doing is anticipating a possible weakness. Essentially, they are defusing a potential objection by showing how that objection is no longer valid. For example, if someone said, hey, your argument has a gap in it because it's only based on six intersections, which isn't the same as the entire downtown area, C retorts, well, most of the deaths happen at these six intersections. So it's an improvement. It's a strengthener because before we just knew it had the highest number of fatalities, but now we're confirming that it's responsible for the majority of deaths. So this is exactly where we should place those signs. Again, it's not perfect because we don't know if the signs are actually going to reduce speed and therefore reduce death, but it's the best answer among all those answer choices quite clearly for me. All the other ones go off track in some direction. So I like that one. It was a fairly clear critical reasoning question and critical reasoning methodology to get the answer right. So final question here to demonstrate these techniques. If this is helping in any way, please do leave a like and leave a comment. Okay, question nine. The Green Peas grocery store in the remote wealthy enclave of Luxville charges more than the store in Oak City charges for the same items. So the store in Luxville charges way more than the store in Oak City for the same items. Well, you could say that's a ripoff or you could say that's just fair because it's the area and therefore you should charge more. Clearly, on any given item, 
the Greenpeace grocery franchise is taking advantage of its location in Luxville to reap higher profits on the item. This is the conclusion sentence as given away by the clearly. And is there something about that that you can spot before I say what I've spotted that you don't quite agree with, that maybe isn't quite watertight? Well, for me, it's saying that they're reaping higher profits. Whereas this sentence said that they charge more. And that's not the same thing. There's a logical leap there. There's a logical gap. Just because they're charging more doesn't necessarily they're reaping higher profits. Maybe their costs are more. Maybe the cost of renting or the cost of supplying those items or the cost of paying their staff is higher in that location and therefore they're not getting higher profits. Notice how I'm predicting the weakness of this argument before I'm even looking at the answers. I'm not distracted by the answers. I'm thinking for myself, what are the weaknesses? What are the problems? And chances are that's gonna help me when I look at the answers. I'm conquering the passage before I get to the answers. So in evaluating the argument, it would be most useful to compare, I'm gonna predict the costs of being based in Luxville versus being based in Oak City. I'm so confident in that, I'm probably just gonna try and find the one that says that. The selection of specialty items, no, we're not talking about the selection. The cost of transporting, with a comparable cost of, yeah, this is comparing costs. Okay, but then so is this one. The average cost of the same or comparable items at other grocery stores in Oak City with the average cost at other stores in Luxville. This is comparing those very items which is what I like, whereas this is talking about transporting merchandise. Hmm, the average cost of the same comparable items at other grocery stores in Oak City. That seems to be like the price they're selling at, right? Because they're talking about the cost of those items rather than the actual cost to the business of selling those items, so affecting the profit. So I'm a bit torn, but I don't know, B just seems a bit better at the moment. And also we're talking about other stores, whereas I really wanna be talking about green peas. So C also has that problem. We wanna be focused on green peas and their location, not these other stores. Anyway, the percent of average household income spent on groceries in Oak City with the comparable percentage in Luxville. The percent of average household income, but that would affect the people buying it, right? and how expensive it is for them, rather than the profits that the store is making. So I don't really see how that would be right. The cost of these items in Oak City and Luxville with the cost of other green pea stores throughout the state. The cost of these items in Oak City and in Luxville with the cost of other green pea stores. It's not really clear the question in terms of, are they talking about the cost of the selling these items, like the price that they're selling them at, or are they talking about the cost to the company? But for that reason, I don't really like E. And also we're talking about other stores throughout the state. Whereas again, I don't really wanna talk about other stores throughout the state. I'm talking about these two stores. So the only answer that seems to directly compare those two stores is B. Obviously, the slight problem with B is that we're only talking about transporting. Ah, yes, that relates to the fact it's remote. Ah, that really justifies B. I was wondering, because B is the best, because it compares specifically the Oak City Green Peas location with the Luxville location. But I was wondering, why are we only talking about transport rather than other costs involved in supplying these uh, items? But then I realized they mentioned that one of them was remote and therefore the transport costs are likely very relevant. So I think this was a great question to go over. First of all, let's check if I'm right. Hilarious if I'm not. And yes, it is B. Great question to go over because that really illustrated all the techniques that I really wanted to teach people. First, how you really want to be predicting an answer and analyzing the text before you look at the answer choices. Notice how I wasn't distracted by some of the worse answers because I already had in my mind the idea that I want to be comparing costs at that store and the other store. Notice how I wasn't distracted by all the answers that talked about other locations throughout the state. No, we're not talking about other stores, we're talking specifically about these two green pea stores. 
And if you look closely enough, actually the only answer that really compared those two stores in terms of costs was B. A did compare the two stores directly, but it was talking about the selection, which is not particularly relevant. So a great question to end on here, really capturing all the different techniques that I want you to learn and practice for critical reasoning. I really hope that helps. And if it did, I can do more videos on critical reasoning in the future. See you in the next video.